we've told a whole generation of kids that your happiness depends on what you do, not who you are. And we've given them a roadmap that takes them right off a cliff. And we've encouraged them for their trouble to borrow more money than they'll ever be able to pay back. Money, by the way, that we can't even afford to lend them, to train them for jobs that don't exist anymore. What happens when you take the art out of a thing, right? We, we took the arts out of high school, the humanities, and there was a great hue and cry, right, when we cut music programs and things like that. And that affected me, and I was one of the ones complaining about it. But before shop class was shop class, it was called Votech. And before vocational technology was called Votech, it was called the vocational arts. <laughs> That's what you've done here. Hmm. You've taken the uh, talismans of work and you've made an artistic expression of them. We didn't just take shop class out of high school one day because we thought we ran out of money. We first took the art out of the vocational arts. Wow. And then we knocked it down to Votech. And then we changed Votech into shop. And then we walked it behind the barn and shot it. That's how we got shop class out of high school. We started with a war not on work, but on, on craftsmanship and mm -hmm. on art. So anytime you see somebody challenging the artistry of I, this, you know, the scales of, I mean, it, there's, there's art in every single thing in here. You either see it or you don't. There's risk in every single activity you ever will perform in here. You either see it or you don't. And so your earlier question had to do with what has changed since my pop built the church I grew up in, <laughs> by the way. Um, what's changed is the chronology of things we value. Work has fallen far, far down the list. Art has fallen down the list. Safety has gone to the top. Mm. Comfort has gone to the top. And the, um, the road we take in pursuit of what we'll call job satisfaction, right? That's changed. That's what's changed. This is a great, I don't know if we have, I don't know how much time we have left, but. Unpack it. All right, let me try and land the plane like this. There was a time when people who were happy in their work didn't start their quest for happiness by trying to identify the proximate cause of their bliss. In other words, what we tell kids today is if you want to be happy in your work, the first thing you do is you sit down and you think about what you want to do. And then once you settle on it, you embark upon a grand plan of action. Now, many times that plan involves borrowing money that you don't have. And uh, then you go to school in order to get all the necessary uh, credentialing that will get you to the next step. And on and on you go. And now suddenly you're 27 years old and you're, and you're on your path to get the job that will make you happy. But you're just running into roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. And now you've got $120,000 in debt. And as it turns out, no, you're not going to be a political scientist with a major in Mideastern studies. As it turns out, now you're, you're serving coffee in a Starbucks. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but that's not what you signed on for. And you're living in your mom's basement again. And you're not happy, right? You're not happy because you, you started with this very specific goal. The people on dirty jobs, Matt, by and large, I'm generalizing, but by and large, None of them are doing the thing that they identified in their youth as their wish fulfillment. These are people who looked around hmm. and said, where's everybody going? I'll go the other way. Where's the opportunity? Septic tank cleaner in Wisconsin. Les Swanson was his name. Terrific guy. Les Swanson from Wisconsin. He, he, was, a, he was a guidance counselor for like 20 years and, he, and, he, and, a, and a psychiatrist, a psychologist. He quit it all, started a septic tank business. Not because he wanted to do that, but because that's what needed to be done. He figured out how to get good at it, and then he figured out how to love it. That's what's changed. We've told a whole generation of kids that your happiness depends on what you do, not who you are. 
<laughs> and we've given them a roadmap that takes them right off a cliff. And we've encouraged them for their trouble to borrow more money than they'll ever be able to pay back. Money, by the way, that we can't even afford to lend them, to train them for jobs that don't exist anymore. Everything is backwards. Everything is disconnected. You touched on something just now that, that hit a nerve with me. It's, it's an identity issue that you aren't who you are. You are what your title says you are. And how do you identify? What, what is your identity based in? Well, look, that was the great lesson of my life because I had enough success up until I was 42 to create a level of hubris in my own work, right? As a guy who impersonated a host, I got enough positive feedback in 20 years in, in TV to feel very confident that I was on the right track as a host. Were you, were you kind of a jerk back then? You know, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, I was still insanely likable, as you know, right? Of course. <laughs> I was kind of a jerk. I was, I was the kind of jerk you run into who, who, was, who was quietly arrogant. You know, All my friends in, in my industry had taken a traditional road. They had gone to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. They'd moved to L.A., right? And they, they all, by the time I was 40, you know, they all had success, but they were all struggling. I was doing pretty good. Not great, but good. And I felt very confident and very kind of proud that I had figured out a business model that worked for me. Mm -hmm. But what I was doing didn't have any real inherent meaning for me. It was just a way to pay the bills and make sure I had four or five months off a year to go see the world and have a fun time. Dirty Jobs straightened me out. Dirty Jobs was the show that forced me to be humble in a way that I, I would have never imagined being on camera, and to assume a new role. Not, not the role of a host or an expert, uh, but the role of an apprentice and a, an avatar, right? Hmm. And so, yeah, for me, when I accepted that new role, I had a new business. And when that show blew up, then other like-minded shows made sense to pursue. And then a foundation emerged and then I got, a, I got a seat at the grown-up table, and I got a chance to sit here with people like you where we can actually talk about topics that I believe can unite the country. Well, we're divided in just about every possible way on every possible thing, but work shouldn't be one of those things. Wow. You know, and, and, I, and I'm afraid it has become a source of division, but, but it can't be. We can't let... We can't let the country have such divergent views on the, defin the definition of a good job or the role of risk in life, you know. And look, if there's a silver lining, and there is, there's several silver linings in coronavirus, uh, but one of them is this clarifying process that's going to force us to think differently about these, these big, epic, thematic ideas. And you can't talk about the definition of a good job without the definition of a worthwhile education. And when you see kids learning from home, when you see college students who are currently enrolled in Harvard, sitting home for another semester for which they are not going to be refunded, but going through the curriculum on nothing but a screen, <laughs> higher education is going to have to think differently about the value proposition. At TBN, our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping make the gospel of grace go around the world. Without you, we couldn't do it. God bless you.